Hello and welcome to TVB News. Hong Kong has technically entered a recession after recording two consecutive quarters of a GDP contraction. However, the government says economic activity is likely to show a revival for the rest of the year. Caleb Leung with more. Hong Kong's gross domestic product decreased by 1.4 percent in the second quarter of 2022 from a year earlier, while rebounding 0.9 percent on a seasonally adjusted quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis. The sluggish figures were mainly due to the weak performance in external trade, as total exports recorded a decline of 8.6 percent year-on-year. A government spokesman said the Hong Kong economy improved in the second quarter. However, the recent increase in the number of COVID cases and tightening financial conditions constrained momentum in the latter part of the quarter. Weaker global demand and disruptions to cross-boundary land cargo flows between the mainland and Hong Kong also weighed heavily on exports. Inflation in the advanced economies, the war in Ukraine and monetary policy tightening by major central banks are expected to dampen economic growth significantly. But the spokesperson said domestically, economic activity is likely to revive in the second half. The extent to which will depend on how the pandemic evolves and how tighter financial conditions affect consumer spending power and sentiment. With two consecutive quarters of GDP contraction, Hong Kong has technically entered a recession. It's a kind of a technical recession. Why? Because uh, is it a trend and then the economy having a long-term recession? Uh, looking at uh, only two quarters may not be sufficient, but um, uh, based on the hist uh, historical uh, data, and then uh, some of the country and uh, normally may be having a two quarters of a recession and then having a rebounds again. So that uh, if you're going to determine whether it's a long-term recession or not, we need to look into a longer duration. Mac expects the disbursement of the second batch of consumption vouchers may help boost the city's economic performance in the third quarter. But for the rest of the year, he said it depends on whether the government will once again tighten in social distancing measures. Caleb Leung, TVB News. The city logged 4,254 4, new COVID cases today, about 400 fewer infections compared with yesterday's tally. However, a 22-month-old female infant who was infected by the pandemic died today. Timothy Lee has the story. During her five days of treatment at the Eastern Hospital, the 22-month-old infant girl experienced seizures and COVID symptoms starting last Wednesday. She had to undergo intubation and used a respirator. Her condition continued to deteriorate and she passed away at noon. We are saddened by her passing and we have sent our condolences to her family. The PYNH has attended to the family of the baby girl and where needed support would be rendered. Other COVID-related deaths include six cases from yesterday, including four males and two females aged between 52 and 84. Three of them suffered from chronic illness and did not seek medical treatment after testing positive. One of them, a 52-year-old man, lost consciousness while working and died after he was sent to emergency treatment. The hospital authority reiterated the urgent need for those infected, especially the elderly, to seek help from hospitals as early as possible. 558 schools in Hong Kong have reported new cases, amounting to 940 infections. Nine additional schools reported classroom clusters. The city's elderly care homes saw another additional case coming from a resident of the Jockey Club Center for Positive Aging. Today, the Department of Health held a meeting to discuss the idea of lowering the vaccination age to six months old. Meanwhile, to decrease the risk of transmission, elderly care homes and public hospitals are now requiring visitors to provide a negative PCR test within 48 hours before arriving. Timothy Lee, TVB News. Macau will reopen public services and entertainment facilities, as well as allow dining in at restaurants from Tuesday. This came as the Enclave seeks a return to normalcy after finding no COVID-19 cases for nine straight days. Beauty salons, fitness centers and bars will be allowed to resume operations, the government said today. 
Health authorities will require residents to wear masks when they go out, and they must show a negative PCR test result within three days to enter most venues. Macau has record, reported around 1,800 infections since mid-June, when it was hit with its worst wave of coronavirus outbreak. This forced the closure of casinos and partial lockdowns. The mainland reported 277 new COVID cases today. Gongsu and Guangxi provinces reported a drop in infections compared with yesterday, logging 81 and 70 new cases respectively. Meanwhile, Shandong, Sichuan and Henan provinces all saw new infections. In Tianjin, an additional asymptomatic case has been reported. An expert from the Chinese Center for Disease Control and Prevention said Tianjin's status as a port city increases the risk of imported COVID cases. A flag-raising ceremony was held at the Central Military Dock to mark the 95th anniversary of the founding of the People's Liberation Army. The police started to set up road barriers in the area around Lung Wo Road at around 5 a.m. At 6 a.m., the Guard of Honor formed by the three forces marched from the Chinese PLA Forces Hong Kong building to the Central Military Dock to conduct the ceremony. This is the first time the dock was used for any Army Day flag-raising ceremony. Overseas U.S. House of Representatives Speaker Nancy Pelosi has arrived in Singapore early Monday, kicking off her Asian tour as questions remain over a possible visit to Taiwan. Pelosi met with Singapore Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong and President Halima Yaqob, as well as cabinet ministers today. Her office made no mention of Taiwan amid intense speculation that Pelosi might visit the island. Former U.S. Defense Department official Drew Thompson said the lack of a mention of Taiwan by Pelosi did not necessarily mean her delegation would not stop by in an unofficial capacity. China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs warned that Chinese military will not sit idly by if Pelosi visits Taiwan. The first ship carrying Ukrainian grain since Russia's invasion has set off from the port of Odessa, according to Turkey's defense ministry. The vessel carrying 26,000 tons of corn is bound for Lebanon. This as Russia killed the owner of one of Ukraine's largest agricultural companies and his wife in a missile strike. Matthew Bray reports. Heavy Russian strikes hit the port of Mykolaiv, killing Oleksiy Vadatursky and his wife in their home. Twelve missiles hit homes and educational facilities in the region. Vadatursky was the founder of Nibulon, a large grain producer and exporter. The company had its own fleet and shipyard. Ukraine President Zelensky called it a great loss and said people like this were guaranteeing food security. The Sierra Leone flagship Razoni set off from Odessa Monday for Lebanon under a safe passage agreement brokered by Turkey and the United Nations. If that vessel can make its way successfully, it could pave the way for others. There are 17 ships docked in Black Sea ports with almost 600,000 tons of cargo. Up until today, Western sanctions and fighting along Ukraine's eastern seaboard have prevented grain ships safely leaving ports. The deal, such as it is, is only valid for 120 days. But it is welcome news for the world at large as an impending food shortage awaits those nations dependent on grain imports from Russia and Ukraine. In another development, Anatoly Chubais, who quit his post as a Kremlin special envoy due to the war in Ukraine, has been hospitalized in Europe with the rare autoimmune disorder guillain barr syndrome that attacks the nervous system. Chubais left Russia in March after resigning. He had served as former President Boris Yeltsin's chief of staff. The news came from a Russian reporter and activist, Ksenia Sobchak, on Telegram. It is not clear where in Europe the 67-year-old is. Russian missile strikes not only continue in the south, they go unabated in the north too. A printing house making school books was destroyed Sunday by Iskander-M missiles. Attacks take place nightly, with Kyiv saying Moscow is trying to get it to pull resources from the Donbass to protect civilians here. 
Matthew Bray, TVB News. Welcome back to TVB News. A government task force held its first official meeting to look into the accident at Canto Pop Band Mirror's concert. With the injured dancer remaining in critical condition, a principal official has vowed to find out the cause of the mishap within one to two weeks. More details from Jackie Lin. The task force's meeting was held at Hongham Coliseum. In attendance were Leisure and Cultural Department Director Vincent Liu and the police superintendent of the Kowloon West Regional Headquarters. Engineer expert Louis Sito was also invited. The former chairman of the Hong Kong Institute of Engineers, Mechanical, Marine, Naval Architecture and Chemical Division expects the entire investigative work to take some seven to eight weeks. Secretary for Culture, Sports and Tourism Kevin Yeo meanwhile offered a shorter time span of one to two weeks for the initial probes. In an RTHK radio program, the culture minister revealed the concert's registered structural engineer would be invited to help with investigations. That's to see if human negligence or mechanical faults are to blame. The Leisure and Cultural Services Department and concert organizers will also be in talks to look into the stage designs and whether additional safety measures were necessary. As Lee Kai Yin, the critically injured dancer, remains in intensive care, his parents left their quarantine hotel in the morning to visit their son at Queen Elizabeth Hospital. And for the first time, Francis Lam, producer of the ill-fated Mirror concert, issued a statement of apology four days after the incident. Expressing great agony towards the grave incident, Lam stressed he never wanted to shirk his responsibility and is now assisting the police and government in their investigations. Jackie Lin, TFB News. In South Korea, a fatal accident at another concert on Sunday. A construction worker fell to his death on the set of a show by Sai, the singer of Gangnam Style. The dead man was said to be a Mongolian in his 20s, employed by a contractor. He fell around 15 meters to his death while dismantling the stage for Sai's Summer Swag concert series in Gangneung Stadium. Local police suspect the worker might have slipped and fallen due to a wet floor. Apart from this incident, Sai's latest concerts have been embroiled in other controversies. They include the use of 300 tons of drinkable water per show and a rise of COVID cases among concert goers. From today, New Zealanders' borders are fully reopened for the first time since March 2020. During the early weeks of the COVID-19 pandemic, the country's borders started reopening in February as the COVID crisis eased, initially only for New Zealanders. And today, visitors who needed visas and student visa holders are able to return. Really good, like gonna be seeing family after almost two years. So yeah, and I'm gonna see my nephew for the first time. It's over three and a half years since the COVID hit. Yeah, so this is the first time we've yes. been back. <laughs> or first time I've been back anyway, but yeah. It's amazing, like it's been just too long. Too long. <laughs> it feels really, really good. Most visitors arriving in New Zealand still need to be vaccinated against COVID and must take two COVID tests after arriving. However, there are no quarantine requirements. U.S. President Joe Biden has tested positive for COVID-19 for the second straight day after suffering from a rebound. White House physician Dr. Kevin O'Connor said in a letter that the president continues to feel well and will keep on working from the executive residence while he isolates. After four days of testing negative following his initial infection of COVID, Biden suddenly tested positive again on Saturday. Experts say it's most likely because he was taking the antiviral drug Paxlovid, which is known to cause rebound positive tests, but with mild to no symptoms. Britain's Prince Charles is facing more questions over his charities. The Sunday Times reported that one of his funds accepted a £1 million donation from relatives of Osama bin Laden. The report said the Prince of Wales Charitable Fund received the money in 2013 from Bakar bin Laden and his brother Shafiq. 
Both are half-brothers of the former al-Qaeda leader who was killed by U.S. Special Forces in Pakistan in 2011. The newspaper said advisors had urged Charles not to take the donation. This was disputed by Charles's Clarence House office, which did confirm the donation. It said the decision to accept the money was taken by the charity's trustees, not the prince. China's ambassador in Kabul, Wang Yu, said Beijing will continue to provide assistance to Afghanistan. He also criticized the freezing of Afghanistan's assets by the U.S. The remark came as Kabul University unveiled a new educational complex and auditorium built by the Chinese government. Five years in the making, the complex was built at a cost of about 200 million yuan. Wang said the buildings are a symbol of friendly cooperation between China and Afghanistan. And back in Hong Kong, the heat is on. The sweltering heat in the city continues as the observatory announced July was Hong Kong's hottest month on record. The heat has led to an estimated 58,000 elderly people seeking medical help with around 2,000 having to receive treatment at hospital. With an average temperature of 30.3 degrees, the previous month's heat broke the 2020 record. For 21 days throughout July, Hong Kong saw temperatures above 33 degrees, with the city struck with feverish heat of above 35 degrees for 10 days. Experts noted several factors had led to the extreme heat last month, including a subtropical high that affected the coastal regions in southern China and global warming. That is the news. Money Matters is up shortly. Bye for now.